And so, Lord, I pray that you inhabit our praises. That's all we can give you. Praise, worship, adoration. We lift your name on high, O oh Lord. We thank you for indwelling this, this auditorium, indwelling our lives, indwelling our, our praise. For Lord, we thank you. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. God bless you. Good morning. God bless you. Please say to him who lives in prosperity, peace to you. Peace to your house. And peace to all that you have. Including our territory and our territory of influence and great peace to our beloved nation, Nigeria, in Jesus' name. Please be seated. Can we appreciate Legacy on the Beat for the awesome presentation this morning? As well as our very own, the International, Dapo Peters and the Dynasty Band. Yesterday's price is not today's price, so our price has gone up. May your, lack, your, may your head never lack oil in Jesus' name. Please help me in welcoming all our guests, our first timers, both physically and online. Welcome to the Citadel Global Community Church, where stars are born and great features are created. We're glad to have you in our midst today, church. Can we welcome them in our special way? Welcome to God's Citadel, your Citadel, my Citadel, and our Citadel, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden, where shining stars are born and great features are created. You would all be warmly welcomed and acknowledged um, during the course of the service. God bless you all for joining us today, and of course, those that are joining online. Um, I'm sure a lot of us know that it's my first time here as well. So, So please, permit me to introduce myself. As I was told, my name is Olusha Bakari. You may have heard of my parents, Dr. and Mrs. Tune Bakari. They send their, their regards and their, their, their blessings. They're not able to be with us physically, but I'm sure that they might be online. Please wave to them and say, please rest, oh. And so please, permit me to be myself this morning. Um, Please, you can correct me after. Technology wants to, okay. Wardrobe malfunctions this morning. Now, technology wants to disappoint me, but the devil's a liar. We are unshaking. I'm unshaking, although my legs are a bit wobbly. Hallelujah. So before we begin this morning, I'm reminded of a story I once heard. I'm sure we might have, we might have all heard it. There are different variations I've heard. Pastor has also told a, a variation of the same story. And the story goes in my own version. There's a story about a revered man of God known throughout all the land and his son and they bear a striking resemblance to each other. Now, the son had unfettered access to the father's notes and could read, sometimes even edit, sometimes add the points, sometimes add the comma, but without the father's knowing. He could read and download virtually all his father's notes. And so he went to his father one day and said, you know what, dad? I have sat under your teachings. I've read your notes. Sometimes I've even had to work with the media team. I, I can almost guarantee you that I can preach any, any message in your notes almost as well as you, if not as fiery. So, of course, like all fathers, the father travels and says, you know what? In my stead, you preach. So soon after he traveled, the son was called upon to minister before his father's 
large congregation. Initially, this didn't seem to face the sun. Note I said initially. But as he mounted the podium that day, uh, <laughs> the confidence was a little shaken. He was even a little petrified. <laughs> so, of course, he goes to his father's notes and he gets part, is it part 14 now? <laughs> of the preeminence of Christ. And then has the long subtitle with all the scriptural references and everything. And he preaches like a house on fire. That's not all, follow me. So at the end, it was, some, it was somewhat of a Bible study setting, even though it was a Sunday. So let's see it was search the scriptures. So at the end, the son had a little bit of confidence now that he has ministered for about 45 minutes. And says, you know what, I have time for one question. Just one. And so the honor fell on the, the person we call in our church, Yadura, you know yourself. A long-standing member of the community and the congregation. And her question, which I may add was not part of the preeminence of Christ too. She gets up, takes a microphone and says, Um, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, can the man of God expand on it? <sighs> oh God, that one is not in pastor's note, so. <laughs> so he scrolls, he scrolls through it quickly and says, ha. Does a quick reference, doesn't see anything. And says, you know what? Yadra. That's a very simple question. But guess what? Pastor will answer in the comment section. <laughs> so, Pastor, if you're online, tell us the answer in the comment section. Um, but just before they revoke my certificate of ordinance, uh, I believe the two witnesses are the law and the prophets, Moses and Isaiah. I could be wrong, oh, Pastor, please correct me if I'm wrong. That's why the Yoruba people say, I know you are waiting for me. I've been practicing. That's why the Yoruba people say, Tioma day by day. Tioma day by day. Ideru. Eru maba. I had to consult with that body yesterday to make sure I wasn't saying rubbish up here. So this proverb conveys the idea that when someone in experience encounters responsibility or challenging situations for the first time, they are likely to feel intimidated or overwhelmed. It emphasizes the weight of responsibility and the natural reaction of fear or apprehension when one is faced with such a great task. And so again, please permit me to be myself. Don't worry, it's just a little sidebar. I'm not going to just tell stories all day. Um, just a, a quick reference. I tried to escape this. I tried. I tried. Senate president was the first to hold me with prayer watch this last week. But I've been told already that um, I might minister this youth month. But you see, last year, I was supposed to minister. And then the drama went on. So I came up and I did a vote of thanks. So... I was hoping that LOB will go on a bit longer. I was even taken off guard when Dakwa and Dynasty Band ended early, that uh, maybe it's just vote of thanks I will come and do it again. But uh, I'm, prepared, I'm prepared to do In fact, you know what? I'll let you in on a little secret. I was so sure. I told my, my colleagues in the youth uh, leadership that I was so sure, without a shadow of doubt, that a very, 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 very important personality was going to be in church today. And I was just going to be like, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a man of God in our midst. I'm not able to untie his shoes. I'm not even able to polish his shoes. So please welcome so and so and so. But as you can see, VIP, no come church today. VIP, you know who you are. Well done, sir. 
And so, before I begin this morning, please stretch your hands towards me and pray for me that the Lord will grant me utterance, that the Lord will speak through me and think through my thoughts, that the word that he has put in my mouth for you all and my generation will not fall to the ground in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for the good work you are doing in our assembly. We thank you, Lord, for the good work and the foundation that has been laid by our founding, um, our seven of us here, and the leadership team. Father, we say amen and amen and amen and amen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our first scripture reference is taken from Psalms 125 verse 1. I would like to read the the entire chapter, which um, is from 1 to 5. It reads, and I quote, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountain surrounds Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Now to be unshaken means to remain steadfast, immovable, unwavering, regardless of circumstances or challenges. It's a state of spiritual and emotional stability where one's trust in God and his promises is so deep that external pressures don't shake them. There may be trials, temptations, but they don't cause them to falter or lose hope. Note, I did not say that being unshaken is about being unaffected by life's challenges. You will be affected by life's challenges, but rather about having the strength to withstand them because of a deep abiding faith in God. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 58 reads, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And Colossians 1, 19 to 23 reads, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, to which I, Paul, became a minister. And then Psalms 112, verse 67. Surely he will will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. And so I have a few characteristics of an unshaken person. Number one. They are rooted in God's word. We have to understand that God's word is the final authority in our lives. They are anchored in the truth of scripture, which provides a solid foundation for their beliefs and actions. Colossians 2, 67. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk with him, walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Number two, they absolutely trust in God. Their confidence is placed not in human abilities or circumstances, but in God's unchanging nature and faithfulness. And we can see that in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Number three, They experience peace in trials. If I'm going too fast for you, catch me on YouTube tomorrow. They experience peace in trials. Even when faced with difficulties, they experience a deep sense of peace, 
knowing God is in full control. Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. And so be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Number four, and lastly, they have enduring hope. They maintain hope knowing that God, God's purpose will prevail. God's purpose and will for their lives will be done. And that his promise is true. Romans 15 verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Say to your neighbor, I am unshaken. And so a quick sidebar, something happened last, uh, two weeks ago. Um, we came for the Thrift Mall Haven. And I came in the morning, set up with the team, and I left around 11 or 12. And then I, got, I get a phone call from Yemi, uh, maybe about one or two. And he said, oh, um, Pastor, Sheg, Pastor Sheg, I'm looking for my laptop. <laughs> Yemi, stop playing with me, Joe. Because Yemi and I have the same laptop. I also know the cost of the laptop. So you can't be looking for that laptop. Laptop that can buy land in Ekwe. Don't call me. You're clearly joking. Just go. So I figured somebody, one of us, would have picked up the bag, and maybe they kept it somewhere. But yeah, me persisted. He texted me. I'm looking for Mr. Tomiwa. Send me pictures of the CCTV that somebody had picked his bag and left the premises. Omo. I don't have money to buy a new laptop, or... I can't give you my own laptop. Or what are we going to do? And I know that Yemi has been a blessing to our community. So if it's something we can do, of course, we will do it to buy him a new laptop. But Yemi's laptop is a machine. It's not a, it's not a mere man. It's not a mere laptop. <laughs> and so, of course, I'm now worried Yemi... I think the following day or the next two days tells me he's going to the police station to file a police report. Ha, Father, please, uh, Joe. Uh, we came for a youth meeting. Uh, we know that we should have been a little bit more vigilant. However, uh, Joe, please, uh, I don't have millions of naira to buy a new laptop. Uh, if I go to Pastor Bella, she will not answer me. Uh. And so I kind of just said a silent prayer in my heart, which I should have learned from pastor's teachings. Not to vow to God. Uh, well, not that he said you should not vow to God. You should not be foolish in vow- vowing to God. Um, and so I said a little prayer. I wasn't going to call Mr. Matthew. I wasn't going to call anybody. I just said a little prayer. I said, Father, if you want me to preach on the fourth Sunday, <laughs> let's hear me get his laptop back. <laughs> and so... It wasn't up to two days later where he sends me a text. Unfortunately, he got his laptop back. I say unfortunately because in my heart, I was hoping I would have to preach. But I was also hoping we get his laptop back. But thank God that we were able to restore, uh, get the laptop back. Um, please, when you come to church, we have been told that many are called few are thieves. So please keep your property to yourselves. Um, what's wrong with technology today? Multimedia, don't do me. It's me and you, like, my brethren. Our second scriptural reference emphasizes Paul's exhortation to Timothy to keep the faith and the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. And this is where I'd like to come for a little while. So please follow me on this journey. So let us establish within scriptural context what is going on in the the two Timothys, as it were. You see, the way I read the Bible, I see it in pictures. I try to, it's as if I'm playing a little movie in my mind. And from a young age, one of the earliest memories I have would be around um, various types of gadgets. Uh, One that I I cannot remember, but I was told was my father's sound system. 
So I purpose in my heart that for his 70th birthday, I'll buy him another one so that he can forgive me for destroying that, that other one. But the second thing, I remember as an inquisitive child, um, they used to record moments of truth then in the house. And so they would keep the cameras in the girls' room. Now, how did I, know the gam- how did I even know the cameras were there in the first place? Because I just saw a large box. I knew they were using it for something. So I went there and I opened it. And years later, I then realized what it was. And perhaps that is why I ended up studying what I studied. Um, and so you cannot blame me for not being a lawyer. I didn't know my father as a lawyer. I knew him as a preacher. I knew him to be on TV. Uh, of course, uh, I knew him to be a great man. And so... Um, as I establish Second Timothy... In film terms, we refer to it as an establishing shot. So an establishing shot is basically saying um, this is what is going on in the scenes to come. How many of you can attest to the saying that when death nears, priorities change? If you have old people around you, I know that when my grandmother was alive, when old people talk, especially when they are wise old people, you listen. Because you, we literally hang on to their every word. And so I remember two of the sayings that Mama would say to me as her, as her days junior. The first one was, Magbagbimi. And I believe like Jacob, she was saying to us and to me, don't leave my bones in Egypt. The, the values and the teachings that I've taught your father and he's teaching you, do not drop them. Carry them wherever you go. And so Proverbs 6, 20 to 24 reads, My son... Keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you are awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Sometimes she will also say to me, Toju babae, Toju babae And of course she was saying, as your father has taken care of me in my old age, make sure you are, there, you, are, you are there for them, you stand with them, and you take care of them too. And so in light of mortality, what used to seem significant may dim in comparison to one's ultimate fate. That's why we listen to a person's last words. When all is said and done, everyone wants to know and understand what gave that person hope in face of death. So 2 Timothy is Paul's last words from a cold and dreary Roman prison. The aged apostle is writing to his son, his protege, Timothy. Paul knew that this letter might as well be the last communication he had with Timothy. And so, of course, he knew his execution was imminent. So he implored Timothy to come quickly to his side. But in case he wasn't able to make it, he wrote the letters that Paul may impart his last words of encouragement to his son in the faith. So may we read from 2 Timothy 1, verse 2 to 7 is our scriptural text, but I would like to read from verse 2 to 12. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace mercy and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who, was, who has saved us and called us with a holy, a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, 
which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. What has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher to the, of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Again, say with me, I am unshaken. I am it may appear that at this time, or if you, chronologically, um, Paul is writing to a, a Timothy that he's saying might be a little timid. Though it's believed that Timothy might have been between the ages of 30 to 40, youth in verse 12 um, of 1 Timothy 4 it was typically used for men under the age of 40. And so if you read in 1 Timothy 4, 12, Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. More on that later. Paul here is reminding Timothy of the essentials of the faith, the basis of the Christian, of his Christian ministry. Paul did not want Timothy to drift away from the truth like phylogus and homogeneous, I believe I pronounced that properly, from the truth that those two gentlemen had strayed away from. Therefore, he passionately exhorted Timothy to hold on tightly to the faith and to the sound teaching Paul had entrusted to him. Paul made sure that whatever counsel he gave Timothy would, would find Sorry, say that again. Paul made sure that whatever counsel he gave, Timothy will find beneath it a rock-solid dependence on God's word. Again, God's word is the final authority in our lives. Timothy's authority will not come from his own wisdom, from Paul's endorsements, or from the acceptance of others. His teaching will stand only to the degree that it was based on scripture. And I believe that's part of what pastor has been preaching with the preeminence of Jesus Christ in his church. The word translated genuine means unhypocritical. In other words, Paul was charging Timothy to rekindle his spiritual, his spiritual life, the desire to discover, develop, and deploy our specific spiritual gifts should be taken like a fire blazing in our bowels. We need to make a conscious effort to exercise our gifts for the common good of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the spiritual gifts and empowers us to use them. God's Spirit does not impart fear, Paul would say, or cowardice, but power, love, and a sound mind. The Spirit imparts power for the various circumstances. The, the love the Spirit gives to us should be directed towards other individuals, love God, love people, like our Creator says. Furthermore, as we use our spiritual gifts to build up the church, we should exercise self-control using our abilities only at appropriate times. So as I read this, I was interested in finding out other examples of a genuine heritage of faith. Of course, in 2 Timothy um, 1 verse 3, if they put up, up on the screen, Paul says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did. And the forefathers there would, the cross reference leads us to Acts 24, verse 14, which says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call, they call, they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. So Paul here is referring to the patriarchs of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The heritage of faith handed down from generation to generation in the Bible is a powerful narrative that brings that begins with Abraham, the father of faith, and continues through his descendants, the patriarchs, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel. The legacy of faith not only shaped the nation of Israel, but also set the foundation for the coming king, the Messiah, and established God's kingdom on earth. This heritage of faith is significant because it shows how God's covenant 
uh, how God's covenants are fulfilled through generation of faithful obedience and trust in his word. The lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, uh, the patriarchs serve as a testimony to God's faithfulness and a model for believers today to pass on their faith to future generations. So, so some other notable heritages of faith include, but are not limited to, Naomi and Ruth, Moses and Joshua, David and Solomon. These examples illustrate the powerful impact of faith when it is intentionally passed down from generation to generation. The heritage of faith is a, is a theme that runs deeply throughout the, the scriptures, demonstrating how God works through families, mentors, and communities. So the heritage of faith is not only passed on from father to son or father to daughter. It could also be from mentors and mentees. Each of, the, each of these relationships show how faith, when nurtured and shared, can lead to great things for God's kingdom. Billy Graham once said, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated, but rather a legacy of character and faith. So Paul offered, Paul in, in, in 2 Timothy offers a central test for measuring whether the gospel torch has been successfully passed down from generation to generation. The application of God's word in four direct ways would ensure that the next generation will become complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in 2 Timothy 3.17, it says that all men, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The first thing to make sure that this heritage of faith is passed on from generation to generation, number one, Paul says is doctrine, which is the basic truth of the faith. We have to pass on the doctrine from generation to generation. Number two, I have it down as reproof, or challenging and, conform, and confronting each other with the word of God. Pastor Sherman said yesterday, I'm sorry, last week, talking about confronting that youth, of course, confronting one another in love. Number three, correction. By providing guidance from the truth, by providing guidance from the truth in scriptures, we ought to correct our generations, um, our children, our mentees, and so on and so forth. And number four, instruction in righteousness, which is the personal and practical application of biblical truths. So again, Paul was encouraging Timothy not to pass the truth of scriptures. Sorry, Paul was encouraging Timothy to not only pass on the truth of scriptures to the next generation, but also pass on the basis of those truths, the word of God itself. You can't pass on truth and don't pass on the word. As we follow in Paul's footsteps, we too must make it clear that the authority of our teaching comes from the Bible. If we teach the truth but do not teach the source of the truth, we will not succeed in passing our faith. Our affirmation and actions have, have to be founded on God's word or there will be little, there will be, it will be little more than wishful thinking. Again, I believe that without willing vessels, like Pastor would say, we are always one generation away from idolatry. If Mother Eunice dropped the ball, I'm not sure that Timothy would have enjoyed such a rich heritage of faith. So again, this morning, in my own little way, I'm here to charge the Legacy Youth Fellowship. Pastor has said to me personally, has also said while I'm ministering here, one of our greatest when I say downfalls, is that we think we have time. We don't have time. And we need to rise to the occasion. Pastor is nearing 70, 70 November. Where are we as the Legacy Youth Fellowship? Are we ready to take on that baton that has been passed on from pastor's generation and the older generation to our generation? And so, just a little shake me up, or a little shake you up, as we go, there's a generation that I can only remember, but I was a child, but such prophetic words, such energy that comes out of such prophecies 
It's not something you, you quickly forget. And so I will say it gently, but I don't expect a gentle response. But I need you to encourage me. So when I say it, you say it back to me. When I feel your energy, I will say it the way I, I believe pastor used to say it in those days. And so randomly while pastor is preaching, he will say, what time is it? No, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. So you're not helping me. What time is it? It's time to take over. No, 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 no. One of the days. One of the days. One of the days. Level is coming up. I'm not going to say it like Pastor says it until I feel your energy. What time is it? It's time to take over. No, no, no. Okay, one more time. One more time. Let's try again. CGCC, what time is it? Why? There are wars to fight, there are giants to kill, there are cities to take. We are God's warriors, we are giant killers, and we are city takers. What a rich heritage of faith we enjoy in this house. An apostolic voice. A visionary, speaking truth to power, a voice of reason, legacy with fellowship, myself included. I don't even, I, can we, is there another proverb or another saying outside of, we have big shoes to fill? I, I don't see these as shoes. Whatever is bigger than shoes, whatever is bigger than that, what has been deposited in our lives, <clears throat> We need to stand up and rise to the occasion. We need to become that generation that answers the dot, dot, dot to that war cry. Have we yet taken over? Or are we saying it's time to take over? Are we extending the territories of God in fighting apostasy in the church? with every tool available to us? Are we carrying command? Are we breaking our ranks? We know that we are a governmental church. Have we subdued kingdoms or are we still, is this still a war cry? We are God's warriors. We are shining stars in whose lives all things are possible because we choose to reign by righteousness. We have such a rich heritage of faith in this house. And I think well, that's in, me inclusive, we are taking it for granted. Our fathers have laid a solid foundation. A solid foundation. It's left for us to lay hold of the work that the generation before us has done and to carry on that baton to the next generation. Do not be missing in action Legacy Youth Fellowship. Now, let's end on this note. What time is it? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good for time. I'm doing, I'm doing good for time. I want to say I learned work, but it's like the work, I've not really learned it yet because I've almost finished my notes. I, I was so sure it was like one hour already. But let's end on that note. I think there's a cautionary aspect that I want to share. And I think it's also necessary. I went to sleep last night. And honestly, hmm, anything could happen. Hmm? Pastor Mike would just get a text. Say, P. Mike, I'm not coming to church today. I'm not, I cannot. Oh, uh, please don't, don't push me out. I'm not ready. Oh. Uh, my, my big sis... Uh, she's now a director. Don't know. She's not DSP again. Now a director. I sent me an encouraging message this morning and I responded. I said, I'll be you preach in my place because let me not go and stammer and say rubbish. Oh, please. Oh. And so the next person I got a text from was my sister who was admonishing me in some of the ways of the Lord and some of the things I, I needed to keep in mind. And so I popped up, this was probably about five, six in the morning. I popped up 
after tossing and turning, tossing and turning, tossing and turning, tossing and turning. And I was like, you know what? Let me reach out to my dad. I'll send him a message. I wasn't going to tell him. Now, if you know my dad, hmm? he acts like he doesn't know. But he knows. But he will also not, he will not, he will also not intrude. He will not come to you and say, God, you are preaching on Fourth Sunday. He will wait. 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 And if you don't say anything, he will not say anything. And when you minister, of course, you know, notes are waiting for you. So I reached out to him this morning and I said, ah, Baba. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. I'm actually not joking. I was in tears. Texting him this morning about five, that. And I also text my mother after. And I basically said that, look, this is my first time. I've envisioned this day many times. But you are never ready. Never, never, never ready. Even this whole week, I had envisioned stepping up, how praise and worship will go. I didn't envision that all my buttons will, will remove, but all good, all to the glory of God. And so I said to him, quoting, you know, I thought I was wise. I thought I was saying wise things. I really thought I was saying wise things. I quoted from 2 Timothy and 1 Timothy, some of what we have read now. And I said, you're not here physically, but I need you to stretch your hands towards me and pray that the grace that you have will come upon me. If you are here, I will say, lay hands on me. But you're not here, so stretch your hands and pray for me. It couldn't have been, it couldn't have been five minutes. My father calls me. Ha, oh, hello. So he says, ah, I knew you were preaching. I was waiting for you to reach out. If you didn't reach out, I will talk to you after. So he says, the two scriptures you quoted here, what is the emphasis? What's the takeaway point? What are you trying to, what, what are you driving at? And so I said basically that what I was trying to say was is we need to be intentional as my generation to receive that baton. Uh, if Lois, Eunice, Timothy, one generation is receiving it from the other. If my generation does not receive the baton, we have dropped the baton here. And that we, we also, as my generation, we need to be intentional. <laughs> PTB. <laughs> then he says something to me, and maybe that's what I was running from. So earlier this week, I knew that God wanted me to say something about broken vessels, but I'm, I'm only just starting. Eh? I'm, I can't come up here and be exposing myself to you day one. At least like me first. <laughs> After you like me, I cannot tell you that, oh, this is the kind of person I am. Oh. So he says, quoting from second, uh, 1 Timothy 4.12, if you can put up, it says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Do you understand where I'm going at all? My father is not a, anybody can get away with anything. He said, Ulushegun, have you abided by that scripture? I said, no. I said, no. And so earlier in the week, I was then able to draw correlations to why God was asking me to speak about broken vessels. You see, youthful exuberance, we think that we have time. Daddy and mommy don't know anything, Joy. I'm not worried. Um, I can do as I like. SP admonished us this morning as if he knew the conversation between my father and I. As the things we are doing now have so many different implications with generations yet unborn. And so, me personally, I think part of my issue was, first of all, I can't even, don't even let me come near this altar, this platform, this whatever you want to call it. Because my father has shared the, a dream he had while this place was under construction. 
that a lion was standing here roaring. <laughs> hey, Joe. I've read, I've read, let me move away from here first. I've read uh, about Aaron's son who uh, wasted for profane fires. It's, so let me not stand here <laughs> because. Uh, hmm. mm. You see, youthful exuberance will cause you to lose focus of your God given destiny. It will hinder the call of God upon your life. It will take away your sense of wanting to exercise those spiritual giftings that you know you have. It will make you ineffective and dull. So I stand here and ask that you stand with me at this time. Stand with me. And starting with me and every single one of us in my generation, we need to ask God for forgiveness and repent. See, God is not mocked. God is really not mocked. He wants us to serve, but he's also principled. And so, Let us pray that past blunders will not affect future destinies. Father, Lord, we thank you this morning. We come repentant before your throne. We will ask you to forgive us for our excesses. We ask you to wash us white as snow. We repent for all the ways in which we might have strayed off, for the detours we have taken, for the disobedience for being stiff-necked. Father, Lord, we pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, you restore us, you forgive us of our sins, you cleanse us of our wickedness. Father, Lord, we pray that our lives will not bring reproach to your name, to the name of the church, to your church, to our families. Father, Lord, we pray that past blunders will not affect our destinies in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. And so, this is where my father helped me to connect to what I thought God was saying to me earlier in the week. He then says, remember the story of Jeremiah at the potter's house. And so, God will take you and he will certainly crush you. But the purpose is not to destroy you. The purpose is to rebuild you. And so the remedy I, we found was in Jeremiah. Go to the potter, who is God. Let him remold you. See, God isn't looking for perfect vessels. And that is the only reason, if anything I can say this morning, is that God is not looking for perfect vessels. If I can stand here this morning... Perhaps in the future, I'll be able to share with you some of the battles my parents have fought. Some of the wars that have been fought in the house. But my time is fast spent already, so I will not bore you with that. But please, God is not looking for perfect vessels. He's working through imperfect ones. Ones that will allow the light of his glory to shine through. And so at your level, wherever you are, repent. Turn back from your wicked ways. Go to God. He will surely forgive. And then cease to walk in those ways. In Jesus' name. And so, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for using me to speak to your people. I pray that you strengthen the faith of everyone present making them truly unshakable in their walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for the rich heritage of faith we enjoy in this family. We thank you for the grace to carry the same message of that to our generation and then to generations yet unborn or to generations yet born. Thank you, Lord, for all that you use us to do in Nigeria, for all the efforts and emphasis you have put and blessings and 
endowments you have put in our Father, our generation will carry a double portion of that. We will not be a generation that turns to idolatry. We'll be a generation that is on the cutting edge of what God is doing. And so we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name. As Legacy on the Beat said, ladies and gentlemen, I stepped up. <laughs>